This is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor and excited to talk to you today about bacterial meningitis with a focus on pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of this severe disease. Learning objectives for this session is for you to be able to define and contrast and compare meningitis and encephalitis, understand the pathophysiology of bacterial meningitis, and know the common clinical manifestations of bacterial meningitis. So just to give you a, a short overview, bacterial meningitis is almost 100% fatal prior to the advent of antibacterials. Clinical disease really results from a combination of the bacteria and its virulence plus a very robust immune spot response and in enclosed space. Morbidity and mortality even today remains very high uh, despite the use of antibiotics and other treatments for meningitis. Therefore, early diagnosis and treatment is key to improved outcomes. Therefore, you as a budding clinician will be very important for you to be able to identify this syndrome early. So let's start with some definitions. So meningitis, inflammation of the meninges, uh, the layer uh, that uh, surrounds the brain um, and in houses the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. You can uh, see here uh, an image of uh, the meninges being pulled back from the brain. The most common symptoms that we see with meningitis are fever, headache, and stiff neck, although we'll talk a little bit more about uh, others. Encephalitis is different, and I think it's important to recognize that encephalitis is inflammation of the brain itself um, and not necessarily the meninges. Uh, you can see here in this uh, MRI scan, uh, this is a patient with HSV encephalitis, and you can see that here there's um, enhancement and edema of uh, the temporal lobe of the brain. Here, you may or may not see fever, but you will frequently see altered mental status, or you may even, see, it may actually be quite subtle sometimes where the patient will uh, have some word finding difficulty or just not making as much sense as normal, may have uh, delusions and other psychiatric type symptoms. Sometimes they'll present with seizures. And then what's probably most common is patients will often present with meningoencephalitis, where you have inflammation of both the meninges and the brain parenchyma. And that can um, start with a disease that actually causes meningitis alone, and then will um, uh, cause disease in the brain or vice versa. So these patients may have a mix of symptoms, fever, headache, altered mental status, seizures, and ultimately may have focal neurologic deficits. So how do bacteria get into the cerebral spinal fluid and cause meningitis? Most commonly, it's hematogenous spread. So hematogenous spread means it gets there via the bloodstream. And usually what happens is there's colonization of the respiratory epithelium, for example, with Neisseria meningitidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza. Um, usually the bacteria are able to colonize the respiratory epithelium, invade through there, get into the bloodstream, and then make its way into the meninges. However, that's in some cases, it happens other ways. So, for example, at a large medical center like ours, where we have a huge neurosurgery program, we see patients who, following neurosurgery, now that there's a direct communication between the outside and the brain, um, you can have direct spread of bacteria um, causing meningitis. But this is less common. So how do you correlate the um, pathophysiology with the clinical symptoms? Well, as I said, first thing that happens is the bacterial invasion into the CSF, and early on you see release of cytokines, and you may have headache and start having fever early on. Now as there is more subarachnoid inflammation, you have breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, and you have neutrophils coming in, now you start having neck stiffness, potentially photophobia. And then as this process progresses, um, you can develop cerebral edema, impaired blood flow, um, because you can get um, vasculitis uh, around uh, these vessels uh, where there's inflammation, um, increased intracranial pressure, and you can even have infarction and focal neurological injury. This could lead to confusion, seizures, neurologic deficits, coma, and even death. So clinically, how do these uh, present? So some of the signs and symptoms of meningeal inflammation include um, headache, um, but headache's not specific. Uh, 
jolt accentu- accentuation the headache. So if you take your head, so sit here, take your head, um, and then and then go back and forth um, and move it quickly back and forth. Um, that's uh, testing whether you have a jolt accentuation of the headache. So is the headache worse when you do that? Uh, you can imagine that that is um, maybe a sensitive but not a specific finding. Um, neck stiffness, uh, again, sensitive but not specific. Photophobia is helpful. So meningeal inflammation can result in photophobia. Um, Koenig sign. So Koenig sign you can see in the picture here um, is because the meninges, uh, inflamed meninges goes from uh, the back of the brain, around the brain, back through down the spinal cord. Um, that inflamed surface, um, when you um, lift your leg up, um, can cause uh, pain. Brzezinski sign um, is when you lift the neck um, that your legs uh, will come up and suggesting also that uh, inflammation through uh, the meninges altogether. So in summary, um, bacterial meningitis is caused by bacteria evading host defenses and entering into cerebral spinal fluid. Clinical disease results in symptoms of systemic infection, meningeal inflammation, and if untreated, um, it may go on to develop severe neurologic damage.